Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong, AWS, and HashiCorp. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting presentation ahead, but first, I have a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. First, today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion or you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live webinar. If you have any questions for our speaker today, we want you to direct those to the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. And that's also where you're going to find the chat tab, where we want you to engage with the rest of the audience that we have with us, as well as just let us know maybe where you're from or any comments you might have. Um, we've also included the slide deck under the handouts if you'd like to copy those to follow along with today's webinar. And there's also a so-called one pager available for download with some additional information for you. Uh, finally, at the conclusion of our webinar, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards, so be sure to stick around. So the topic of our webinar today is getting HashiCorp Terraform into production. And I'm joined today by Mike Tharp, Senior Solutions Engineer at HashiCorp. Mike, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm going to let you run the show from here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Cody. And uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get that presentation started. All right. <clears throat> so I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we are going to be talking about HashiCorp Terraform and how to get that into production. My name is Michael Tharp. I'm a senior solution engineer here at HashiCorp. And um, before HashiCorp, I was, I've been with HashiCorp for about three years now. Before that, I was uh, a practitioner for over 20 years. So as we get started, I'd kind of like to start on the uh, Terraform core and kind of review uh, what Terraform is, right? So if you're not familiar with Terraform, Terraform is a infrastructure as code solution, right? Being able to take code and actually realize that into actual infrastructure. And that really is the foundation for what Terraform is. And as we start to scale up, we start to realize things like compliance and management and self-service become necessary. And I'll go into those in a little bit more detail. So let's talk a little bit about what infrastructure as code is, right? So infrastructure as code gives us a lot of advantages that we didn't have over maybe traditional scripting or clicking through an interface or, or SSHing into a terminal and making configuration changes. The one thing that it does is it really provides us the ability to be able to document everything that we're creating, right? So we don't have to go to things like, you know, run books or wikis that generally are going to be out of date about the second we get done with them. And the other thing that we do is we're able to actually uh, intertwine this with version control, right? So we write our code, we put it into version control. And what this does is this gives us the ability to see everything that's changing along the way, as well as being able to roll forward and roll back. Now, if you're familiar with Terraform and that infrastructure as code idea, the one thing that might be interesting is Terraform using infrastructure as code, but then also using policy as code, doing our policy in the same way to try to move away from that traditional spreadsheet or Word document that we traditionally get from security, who says, hey, we need you to, your infrastructure to be secured in this way. Those really aren't actionable items, so that makes it very difficult for us. But with Terraform, we can actually define that code as policy. And then finally, uh, Terraform works off of a core plus provider model. So the core of Terraform actually compiles all the code, but then we use uh, providers to be able to uh, allow us to extend to really any infrastructure. Those are open source and they're generally created uh, either with HashiCorp, third party, you can create your own as you go. So uh, really flexible infrastructure as code gives us a lot of benefits. So I wanna talk a little bit about the provider, specifically the AWS provider. <clears throat> so as we look at our providers and using that core plus provider model and being able to extend out what Terraform gives us is it gives us a, this unique ability to be able to provision, but not use something like least common denominator provisioning, right? A VM is not a VM on-prem as it is in AWS. We don't want to lose any of that feature richness that comes along with, with provisioning, uh, no matter where we do it. So with our AWS provider, we have deep integration with all the AWS services. And we also co-develop that with AWS. So what that advantage to us and to you is that you're actually able to um, utilize services and features and functionality um, that are that are kind of native to the AWS platform. So commonly, one of the things that I get a common question is, OK, so I'm using Terraform open source today. When do I need to start looking at something like Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise? It's a great question, and it actually all relates to organizational complexity. So 
to kind of understand how Terraform was created, Terraform was created with a, a single person or maybe one or two people in mind. Uh, it was really designed for an individual. It wasn't designed to kind of scale with an organization. So as we start to look beyond that and say, you know what, infrastructure as code is great, but I need to start looking at compliance and management or self-service, these organizational complexity items uh, are where we start to look beyond just Terraform open source and start to look at Terraform Cloud to provide those features and functionality. And so that's kind of the uh, the growth curve, right? So we, we look at infrastructure as code. It is the baseline for everything that Terraform does, no matter whether we're talking about Terraform open source, Terraform Cloud, or Terraform Enterprise. It is the baseline. But then with those Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise features and functionality, we add compliance and management and self-service infrastructure. So let's take a look at open source and kind of see what open source is if you're not familiar with it. This may be a little bit remedial if you're, if you're using it today, but it's just important that we kind of set a baseline for what Terraform open source is and what that workflow looks like. So with Terraform open source, we're gonna start with a single machine, right? It's generally gonna be your laptop or your desktop, and you're gonna go download Terraform, and it is just a binary that we can really run uh, from that machine. What we'll do is we'll create some configs, right? Kind of take our infrastructure and start defining what that is, maybe build some really cool stuff, and then we'll run a Terraform init. And what Terraform init does is it actually looks at our code and figures out what we need, things like the AWS provider. It will actually go out and download those down onto that laptop so that it can use those in order to be able to compile and connect. From there, we'll run a Terraform plan. Terraform works off of a two-faced approach, plan and apply. You'll hear me say that a couple times, but it's important to understand. When we run a Terraform plan, we're not actually gonna be making changes. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at our code, we're gonna connect to AWS, or we're going to connect to our on-prem resources. And we're going to give an idea of what that's going to look like and what changes we're going to see before we make any changes. So this starts to give us that confidence of saying, yes, our code's correct. It's making the changes that we want to make. And then from there, we do a Terraform apply. And this is really where the rubber meets the road, where we really start to see that actual provisioning happening. So Terraform from your laptop will connect directly to AWS or maybe your private data center and start deploying those configuration items that you defined in your code. And then finally, we're going to take everything, we're going to wrap those into a state file. Uh, Terraform is a stateful application. So we keep track of all the resources and all their configuration items that we're going to do with Terraform. So there's some considerations as we start to look at Terraform open source and trying to scale, right? So let's kind of talk what those are. The first one, and if you're trying to scale it today, you probably noticed this is a problem, access keys. How am I going to deal with things like access keys? And traditionally people will put them in environment variables or maybe hard code them into a config file. The bad part about that is we are kind of trapped onto that one machine. And, and really if somebody has access to the machine, we're one ENV command away from being able to say, hey, here's all my, here's all my access keys and my secret keys, or maybe my database uh, secrets, whatever those may be. And then we have a state file. Now, the state file is very important to Terraform because it is stateful and it keeps track of everything that we, we're doing with that infrastructure, but it always contains sensitive data. So we have to be able to protect it. And the state file, if it's trapped on this machine, it really doesn't allow us to collaborate, right? We, we don't really have this ability to be able to bring other team members in unless, unless we're going to let them use our laptop, right? So it's not real handy in that regard. And then finally, we don't have an API. All we have is a command line binary that we're using in, uh, on, our, on our laptop. We don't have a an API, if we're going to try to automate, that really is the gold standard. So a lot of times what we'll see is, you know, scripting or, or trying to wrap this process. And, and really what that comes down to is, is these workarounds, right? So you're scaling up, you're saying, how am I going to work around this problem? Almost always what I see is uh, folks trying to wrap this into a CICD process, right? So take a CICD engine, whatever your, your CICD engine of choice is, and trying to wrap this Terraform binary into that specific process. Now there's still some downsides that we have. We have to provide our access keys to say that Jenkins or uh, GitHub Actions. And the one thing that's interesting about CICD is if somebody does gain access to your network or to, to your resources, CICD engines are the number one targeted area in most cases. Why? Because they generally have keys or they have secrets in them and they don't always protect them the way we want them to. And as well as that, if, if I'm just giving people access to be able to run that CICD engine, they can essentially do ad hoc jobs and be able to pull those secrets out using those same ENV commands. So it, it's kind of a downside when we start to look at this wrapping, as well as we have to start figuring out a way to deal with these state files, right? This is still a problem. So 
we're trying to control access, right? Maybe we put them on an object store and we can encrypt them, right? In transparent encryption is transparent decryption, which means if somebody has access to your network, they can get to them, they can read that. We know it has sensitive data. And now we're starting to scale out, right? So we're going to have these in multiple locations. So that attack surface actually becomes a little bit wider. So ultimately, when we start to scale up, this is what we see, right? And I will tell you that from personal experience, this is exactly what happens inside of large organizations. Even small organizations will have this. So we'll have different teams all doing something different. The workflow looks completely different. So Dev Team X, right? They're going to use that laptop. They're used here from open source on that laptop, and they're just going to keep everything trapped on that laptop. Really not very collaborative, but hey, it gets the job done. All right, we're good with that. But Dev Team Y says, that's just not good enough for us. What we're going to do is we're going to use VCS, right? And we're actually going to uh, put our state file on an object store. And then we're going to use something like a Bastion host or something like that. And then, you know, Dev Team Z, maybe it's our DevOps team where they're going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to wrap all this in CI, CD. But the consistent thing here is the inconsistency in workflow, right? I can't have somebody go from Dev Team X to Y to Z and be able to do their deployments. And the other thing that we lose is that visibility, right? So now we're all using something different. Our codes may be stored in different areas, and we don't really have control or visibility in what's happening across our enterprise. And when we start to look at this from a security perspective, if we put on a security hat and we talk to our security friends, these are the things that we see when we have these, these kind of disparate workflows, right? We don't have any visibility. Operationally, everything's kind of different, so we can't have teams really working together and collaborating in a meaningful way. And we're not managing our secrets, right? How do we enforce all this? These are the common questions that we see, and security teams just do not like this, this decentralized idea and no visibility. It, it really hinders their ability to be able to secure our platforms. And this is where I want to start to talk about Terraform Cloud. So Terraform Cloud is built on open source. So when we looked at that original diagram where, where it said infrastructure is code and then compliance and management and self-service, you'll notice that Terraform Cloud is no different. It's using that infrastructure as code base. And it is building upon that open source idea. The difference between Terraform Cloud and maybe Terraform Enterprise is the idea that it's fully managed code as a service, right? So we're, we're providing the enterprise service out of the gate. Um, the other things we include, like I said, uh, compliance and management to be able to manage our um, our compliance and make sure that we're we're actually um, doing things like guardrails. So when we start to enable self-service infrastructure, we can allow users to easily provision, but stay within the bounds of that compliance and management. And then just overall enterprise features, right? Enterprise features and functionality that we would expect with any enterprise application is what we're talking about with Terraform Cloud. So let's take a look at infrastructure as code and kind of what this workflow looks like. So at HashiCorp, when we look at workflows, it, we look at it as consistency is the key to success, right? So whether we're um, you know, five people on a team or 50,000 people on a team, uh, we want to have that consistent workflow. So when we, enterprise, when, we, when we look at Enterprise and Terraform Cloud, what we see is this very consistent workflow where everybody has the same entry point, but we start to segment our different workspaces, right? We have this ability to do things like uh, lifecycle management, where you have dev, test, and production, where we can actually kind of move those life cycles. We can even segment this based on application or maybe team. We're still using that two-phased approach for plan and apply, but we start to include things like policy check. We have the private module registry to be able to introduce uh, code snippets and make things really reusable. And ultimately, we're going to be able to deploy in that consistent manner. Right. So the, the one thing that I can say is when we look at the management of our infrastructure, commonly we say, well, we manage our infrastructure. We kind of look at it as a monolith. But that's not really helpful as we start to scale up. Right, because we're not really managing it as a monolith. We have so many different applications and technologies. So we want to start to look at things like micro infrastructures and being able to control the area of which we wanted to deploy. Now I talked a lot about state and, and this is a common thing to, to kind of come up against when we're in the open source uh, realm. So in Terraform Cloud, we actually solved this problem for you. Uh, inside of Terraform Cloud, we're actually gonna store your state file, right? We're gonna secure it so it's gonna be fully encrypted. And then ultimately we're gonna provide RBAC controls to be able to say, some folks are allowed to see these and other folks aren't. And what this unlocks is that when we start to get down in the self-service area, we know that there's sensitive information in these state files. And so what we're going to do is we're going to provide RBAC controls. And maybe we have an ops team who, because of the division of labor or least privilege type access, 
we can't have them seeing that that uh, sensitive data. So what we do is we we say you're allowed to make Terraform runs, but you're not allowed to view these these uh, sensitive areas. As well as Terraform Cloud gives us that revision history. We can see every run that's happened and what changed along the way. So now we're also sure. taking things that we did in VCS and we're seeing our infrastructure move forward with our infrastructure as code. We're also able to track those completely down to every change that Terraform made, right? So we get that full visibility, full view, and few con full control inside of Terraform Cloud. Now, with VCS being such a uh, pivotal part of what we do, what we what we do with Terraform Cloud is we actually integrate this directly into VCS. So there's a lot of advantages here, right? We're using VCS. We've got things that are versioning. We're moving things forward. And what we'll do with Terraform Cloud is we'll actually connect it directly to your VCS. And then we can start including things like checks, right? We call these speculative plans. And what they do is they give you the ability to create a check to say, I want you, when somebody commits code, I want to actually check and make sure that it's actually going to work. Just like we do that dry run plan, Terraform will do that automatically. And then you can actually uh, result that inside of your VCS. So a lot of advantages there, and it really kind of tightens up our VCS to provisioning workflow so that we can do things like automatically triggering runs and where we can say, hey, you know what? I made some changes inside of my code. Now I want Terraform to actually apply those changes for me automatically, or maybe I want to have a point where there's an approval process. We can support all of those inside of Terraform Cloud and that, that tight connection makes it really easy for us to move forward and roll back if we need to. Now. Secrets are a common problem with provisioning, and we solve those in Terraform Cloud by using secure variable storage. So these secure variables that we, we need, things like access keys or SSH keys, we have to be able to make them available to Terraform. But we don't want everybody to have access to them. The same way we want to control our state, we want to control our secure variables. So in this idea, what we do is we have the ability to, inside of a workspace, to define uh, your secure variables mark them as sensitive, and then what happens is nobody can ever see that value again. Only Terraform knows the value. So if we give access to, say, that, that same ops team, and they're not allowed to have things like access keys or secret keys or SSH keys, what they're going to see is what you see on the right here, where you have the definition of that variable, but then what you also have is the value, say, sensitive and the right only. You can overwrite them, but you can't actually pull that out. And this really is part of that self-service mechanism and just overall security mechanism to make sure that we're keeping all of our secrets secure. Now, along the way, you're going to hear workspaces again and again. Workspaces are a construct that allow us to create segmentation. Again, we don't want to manage in a monolith. We want to start to manage in these, this micro-infrastructure type of realm, right? Maybe this is based on teams. Maybe this is based on technology. Maybe it's a a specific application layer, we can segment all those things. And, and the value behind this is, is very common where you say, I want to make a change, but I don't want to affect everything else, right? I want to make a change to my web layer, but I don't want it to affect the database layer. So these workspaces allow us to create these RBAC controls and really fine grained security controls, as well as keep us safe for the, for the areas that we want to make these changes. So in the example that we have here, we have a compute team and a network team. Right? They have to be able to work together, right? The compute team needs the network team, the information that the network team provides for their, for their specific provisioning requirements. So what we can do is we can actually allow the network team to share the information that is necessary to the compute team, and the compute team can make their changes without having any direct access to the networking team's configurations. Maybe they can view them, but they can't write them. So this unlocks a lot of possibilities of being able to collaborate and enable different uh, groups to do what they need to do without having to um, get rid of that specialist type idea. All of these work, uh, workflows are supported by VCS integration and all of them are gonna be based on um, remote execution and, and you can do all this via an API. So really, really powerful when you start to talk about that empowerment inside of our organization. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about compliance and governance. So just like we have infrastructure as code and we want to have that consistent workflow, we also have to look at this in the same way when we start to talk about compliance, right? So this is the same diagram that we had before. And, and I mentioned, we're going to have that policy check in the middle. It's called Sentinel. And what this does is this actually allows us to inject our security policies, making them very actionable so that we never actually uh, deploy anything that is misconfigured. 
We're defining our policy the same way we define our infrastructure as code so that we can use that and make that very, very actionable. So this is called our Sentinel, as, uh, Sentinel Policy as Code Framework. And really, like I said, it really allows us to define what our policies are and kind of move away from that spreadsheet or that Word doc idea and make it really, really actionable so that that way, when we're doing our provisioning, we can actually include security in as opposed to waiting to the end and then trying to figure out if we're secure. Because if we're, if we're getting to the point where we're deploying one resource every week, well, manually securing them is possible. But when we start to look beyond that and say, okay, I'm gonna do a thousand a day, a thousand an hour, 10,000 an hour. Maybe I'm scaling up and scaling down uh, very dramatically. In that scenario, we need to include security as a part of the provisioning process, as opposed to doing it at the end in some sort of type of waterfall manual process, because as we scale, that just won't be possible. Now, along with that policy, usually comes cost estimation, right? We wanna know how much something's gonna cost. So with Terraform Cloud, we actually include cost estimation as a part of that policy check, cost estimation, and I can actually write policies around that cost estimation. So I can start doing things on restrictions and saying, hey, maybe our dev environment isn't allowed to have specific instances, or maybe they're allowed to have specific instances, but they can only cost this much per run, right? That way, as we're scaling up and scaling down, we're also keeping an eye on all of our costs, right? So we don't have to write policy around it, but we can. And really the whole idea here is visibility. What am I doing in my environment? Am I securing it? And what does it cost? Now, no enterprise software would be uh, complete without SSO, right? Nobody wants to create another username and password to manage. Uh, no security team wants another area where they have to manage uh, rotations and password policies and all that. So we'll actually integrate with your existing um, authentication provider, whatever you're using. We're going to use SAML to do that. And we're just going to bring everybody in that we want to have provisioning. So that way we can follow all of your normal corporate uh, standards as far as your uh, logins, but we don't have to worry about doing that inside of uh, Terraform Cloud specifically. We'll take everybody and bring them into teams, just like we group people into maybe OUs or specific groups. We're gonna do the same thing inside of, Ter inside of Terraform Cloud. We're actually gonna use these teams to define our permissions, and then we can put people in different teams to allow them access to specific workspaces so they can see all the workspaces, or maybe they can only see their workspace. They can do things like, uh, C state files, or maybe they can't. So this really allows us to define that fine-grained RBAC controls, um, but then also define those to a specific workspace. Now, when we're talking about enterprise features and functionality, nothing would be complete without audit logs either. We have to have audit logs to be able to see what's going on. And Terraform Cloud makes that available to us. So not only do we have the, the history of everything that we changed in code via our VCS, Right, we have all of our run history and our state history. We also have everything that happens inside of Terraform gets logged. So now when we have things like a SIM or maybe we're using something like Splunk as a log ag aggregator, and actually Splunk's a really interesting use case because with Splunk specifically, uh, they actually wrote in their um, app store, you can actually choose a Terraform cloud, basically plug that directly in, do some configurations, and they'll build dashboards based on those audit logs that are available. So you can start seeing things like run histories and just kind of give a dashboard overview. So audit logging is a, is a key fundamental when we start talking about scaling up and, and knowing what Terraform is doing. Another thing that I would point out here is if you've ever come in on a, if you've ever gone home on a Friday and you said, man, everything's working great. And then you come in on Monday and everybody's kind of running around and you're like, what happened? What changed? This actually gives us the ability to not only go into a specific run, but we can go to the audit logs and see if anything changed. So it helps us in that troubleshooting process as well. And knowing that we can actually go back through and reapply our configurations because we are stateful makes that really, really easy as far as uh, any kind of recovery that we want to look at. So a lot of features and functionality here, uh, a lot of benefits when we start talking about management and just overall control of our infrastructure and our automation. So now that we understand infrastructure as code and we have a way to control that, we're including our policy and governance as uh, a part of our actual provisioning workflow. Let's talk about self-service infrastructure because now we have that availability to take that same workflow and actually introduce people who maybe aren't necessarily Terraform experts, but they need to be able to do deployments, right? They need to be able to deploy certain technologies. Maybe it's an application or maybe specific types of infrastructure or specific technologies that we've defined. What we can do is we can actually enable that to make that very, very easy. 
And we do this via modules. So if you're familiar with Terraform, you're probably familiar with modules. And modules are really templated infrastructure as code. You want to think of them as kind of like a blueprint of something, right? You can kind of say, this is an application stack, or maybe this is how we do an EC2 instance, or this is how we do an on-prem instance. This is how we define what a database is. And really what that is, is that's the producer-consumer workflow that you're seeing, right? Where you have a Terraform team, and you don't want to restrict your provisioning only to the Terraform team because that kind of restricts how quickly we can move it as an organization. We want to empower the other teams to be able to do these things, but make sure we're doing it safely. So these modules, along with our security and governance that we already have, really extend this to allow us to um, take these people in and say, all right, here's what we're going to deploy. I'll show you how to deploy it. You basically take these modules, you plug them in, you run them. It makes it really easy to be able to launch standard infrastructure that's, that's made and secured for our organization. Now, those modules, if you're familiar with using modules in Terraform open source, what you know is you spend a lot of time doing things like Git refs, right? Um, to start refing a specific tag inside of VCS, and that becomes kind of cumbersome. It's really difficult to move forward and move back and start doing revisions. So in Terraform Cloud, we actually introduce a module registry. Now, if you're familiar with our public module registry, which is registry.terraform.io, what you'll know is there's a lot of things that are offered there, right? You can go out there and see, uh, there's a EC, one for EC2 inside of AWS, ECS, EBS volumes. There's a lot of different code that you can actually take and get started right now, today, and not have to worry about writing your own. But you probably are going to have to modify those for your specific use case, right? Those are very general. So we may have some very specific things that we want to configure. And we also want to make that really easy to reference inside of our code. So in this case, we want to use something like our private module registry. The private module registry allows us to host those things and version them very, very easily and reference those inside of our code without having to go to specific long git ref tags. Um, as well, you can actually go from the private module registry, you can actually search the public module registry without leaving that, that the private module registry inside of Terraform Cloud. And you can actually choose to pull those modules in, customize them as you choose. That way you're not having to fork or trying to copy code directly out of GitHub. You can actually go directly inside of that private model registry and get started and get moving very, very quickly and really customize those specific resources for your needs. And then finally, talking about remote operations, right? So all of this is, is controlled by Terraform Cloud, and we're going to actually run our operations inside Terraform Cloud. That's what enables this workflow, right? Terraform Cloud is, is able to view everything that happens, everything from the plan, the policy check, the cost estimation, they apply. The benefit behind this is if you think back to what we're talking about being trapped onto a laptop or maybe a server, in this case, what I can do is I can kick off a run, I can close my laptop and go home. Why? Because Terraforms actually manage those operations. That makes things really, really easy when we start to talk about scaling up and running multiple runs and including many different teams. But also when we start to talk about using things like an API and using Terraform to extend your CI CD pipeline. This is really, really powerful from the aspect of just making sure that we have complete visibility of everything that's running without having to sacrifice any of our workflow. And in fact, if you're using the command line today and you're just really set on using the command line, you can actually still use the command line interface. It looks like it's running on your machine, but again, you can take that laptop lid, close it and go home and Terraform will continue on because it's actually running from Terraform Cloud. So, if what I've said resonated here and you say, you know what, that sounds great, but I wanna know how to get started. Let's talk a little bit about what that adoption journey looks like. So when everyone gets started, almost everybody starts with open source because you, you can bring it down, you can kind of test on your machine, maybe deploy some, some smaller infrastructure and, and really try to learn the Terraform platform from the infrastructure as code perspective. But like we said before, as we start to kind of go beyond that, we wanna start looking at different uh, options. So Terraform Cloud has, essentially three different areas where we can help, right? Starting off, we have a free version. This is where people kind of start, just like we did with Terraform Open Source. We start with this Terraform Cloud to be able to do th simple things as infrastructure as code and, and just kind of basically manage state. Not, we don't really have those fine grain RBAC controls. We have a few controls and we're really limited on how many users, but this kind of gets us started so we can get the feel for and understand how we're going to scale. Now, when we start to look at things like standardization, this is where we start to look at Terraform Cloud from a team and government governance perspective. So that team and governance perspective, we start to, to bring in things like policy as code. 
for management and enforcement. You have the ability to actually bring on and onboard a few more users along the way. And then finally, when we want to get to that, that full enterprise service, we call that Terraform Cloud for Business. That includes all the features and functionality that I talked about today. So things like self-service are included, audit, security, all the things that we talked about, uh, as well as support. So we, we can kind of help you along your journey. So if you want to get started today, you can go to uh, uh, Terraform Cloud. You can open up a free account and kind of play around with it and, and kind of get used to it. If you want to take that journey of saying, hey, I'm already there, and I really want to start talking about governance and security and policy, absolutely. We can start you with Terraform Cloud with teams and governance. And if a lot of folks will say, you know what, that's all great, but I really want that enterprise service. You can start talking about Terraform Cloud for business and uh, actually getting started and being able to unlock all of those features and functionality that we have inside of that platform. So like I said, if you wanna get started today, uh, you can actually go open up a uh, Terraform Cloud account um, and you can actually do a trial, but that actually won't be Terraform Cloud for Business. So if you actually send an email with your organization name, when you, when you create that organization to that email address, what we'll do is we'll actually give you a 60 day free trial uh, to be able to do that so you can do those AWS provisioning and, and configuration items that you that you want to test out. As well as um, we've actually teamed up with AWS to create a uh, self-paced workshop. So if you look at the very bottom there, hashcorp-terraform.awsworkshop.io, uh, you can actually go there and then we'll actually walk you through step by step what, what I've talked about today of you know creating workspaces and connecting your VCS and then putting your code in place and making code changes and deploying some and uh, resource provisioning, as well as destroying all that if you're, if you're done with that, is that's just a task. So really handy, really nice to be able to get started. Uh, we wanna make this really easy for you. So that really is the end of my presentation and I hope that was valuable to everyone. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. I don't know if we have any questions, but I'll be glad to answer them. And uh, thank you for your time. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. So while we give our audience just a few more seconds, moments to send anything in, I'll go ahead and give everyone a reminder that this, this webinar was recorded. You will receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand shortly after we conclude. And you can also find the recording living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars. Um, I'll also take this opportunity to go ahead and give away some Amazon gift cards. So our first winner of these four $25 Amazon gift cards, the first winner is Tracy E. Our second winner is Da Vinci S. Our third winner is Kendrick D. And our fourth and final winner is Carlos Q. So to the four of you, please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. And if you don't receive an email, just check your spam folder. Mike, I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment. So um, is there anything that you would like to leave our audience with before we conclude? Well, if I can leave you with anything is that, um, you know, the challenges that, that, that I pointed out in the, in the presentation, if they're real to you, just take a look at Terraform Cloud. Um, it will definitely help you. It will help you in your journey to be able to do provisioning. And if you're new to Terraform, you know, get started with open source if you'd like, but you can actually get started with Terraform Cloud as well. Um, and then if you're, if you're ever wondering, this is a common question I get, so I'll just kind of, I'll just kind of go with a question that I commonly get is, I'm using Terraform, but I have something like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, SaltStack, something like that. Can I use those in conjunction or, or is this a and, is this an and or an or? And, and really it's a better together story. So if, you, if you're using something like a configuration engine, configuration management engine, Ansible, Chef, Bump and Salt Stack, whatever that may be, uh, we can actually include that in your um, in your provisioning. So when we define a resource, let's say it's an EC2 instance, we can actually include that provisioner in there and say, you know what, I want to use Chef, and here's the information that I need to give to connect to Chef and do those things, or I want to do it with Puppet, or I want to do it with Ansible, and whether that's um, Ansible Enterprise, uh, Chef Enterprise, whether you're using open source and you're trying just getting started. We can actually include that and it actually becomes a, a, a key part of your, your deployment. So if you're saying, hey, to Terraform, I want you to deploy this resource and I'm including a provisioning engine, both things have to pass for it to be successful. Otherwise, Terraform will actually air out and say, hey, you didn't, you know, you we provisioned it okay, but your configuration didn't go through okay. And then what you can do is you can rerun Terraform, it'll remove that, that uh, misconfigured instance and restart that again. So that way you're always guaranteed 
to get the appropriate configuration. So it is a better together story, right? Uh, Terraform is not a configuration management engine and you know the configuration management engines are not deployment engines. So we really do work uh, very closely and there's a lot of documentation on that, but that's a common one that I get. So we did receive a question. Um, this participant asks, does Terraform Enterprise support integrations with proprietary enterprise registries? I'm not sure what you mean about proprietary inter enterprise registries. Um, you know, as far as as far as uh, if you're talking specifically, so let me let me also clarify. So when you when you talk to us, what you'll hear is Terraform Cloud or Terraform Enterprise, and they really are interchangeable. The only difference between Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise is Terraform Enterprise is actually installed on prem. Same features, same functionality. Uh, the only difference is you have to manage all the infrastructure. And really, Terraform Cloud is what most people will use because they don't have a data sovereignty requirement that requires that they install it on-prem. But if you do have that, just understand that that's available to you. Now, if you're talking about things like um, enterprise registries as far as like modules, we'll actually uh, integrate with GitHub directly or your VCS, whatever VCS, I say GitHub, but if you have a, a VCS connection, uh, say at GitLab or Bitbucket or ADO, we'll actually work with those as well to, to do those registries. So if that's the integration you're talking about, absolutely. That's in fact, that's how we do it as we actually uh, require tagging and then we'll actually take all those and run all those together and make it very easy for you to reference those versions. So I hope that helps. Awesome. So um, to our audience, we really appreciate the time that you took out of your day to join us today. Um, we ask for one extra moment after we officially conclude the webinar for you to fill out a post-webinar survey. It should only take just a few seconds. Um, but other than that, I would like to thank AWS and HashiCorp for sponsoring today's webinar. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. I hope that everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning webinar.